Hello and thanks for streaming this episode from ACF Church. Our hope is that this word would encourage you to walk closer with God and with your local church. We hope you consider partnering in the work God's doing here by joining a life group, serving, and giving. If you'd like to give financially to the mission of ACF Church, you can do so safely on our website at acfak.org or by texting the amount to 907-341-4213. Now prepare your hearts to hear God's word. My name is Megan. I am a vocal coach, and I also sing from time to time here on the worship team at ACF. I've been coming here for a little over a year. When I was young, I actually grew up right up the street. would go to the Episcopal Church off Eagle River Loop with my family. My mom and dad were founders of the church, so we obviously would go. I grew up there since I was three years old. After graduating high school, I kind of dropped out of just church because it was kind of something my mom made me do. <laughs> then I took a little hiatus. I'd go to church every now and then with family or for Christmas, Easter, things like that. Four or five years ago, I had somebody in my life that was going through some tough times and I watched them decide to go to church and it changed them and made them somebody I didn't even recognize almost. There was this sense of peace with him that I'd never seen before and it just made me so happy because I know that they were struggling inside for them to take that step forward in faith and for me to see what was happening with them was it just made me just think a bunch i remember driving down minnesota one day and saying maybe i should try going back to church maybe it'll work for me maybe i don't really feel like i need it i was one of those people that always was like oh i have my connection with god by myself i don't need to go to church la 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 but it actually it makes a huge difference going to church and just having the people that you know and seeing them every Sunday and working with them and being with them and knowing that they feel the same way about God that you do. It's just a great feeling. And watching him go from this deep, dark place into basically hope was really cool to see. And after I came here, I realized how much this feels like home on top of the fact that this is where I was raised. Everybody here is just salt of the earth people. They are true to who they are. And it's just, it just feels like home. It feels like family. My name is Megan, and that's why I need church. That's good. Hey, welcome to church, everybody. My name is Brian. I'm one of the pastors here, and I just want to say welcome. If you're brand new uh, to ACF and to this gathering, we are so glad that you're with us today. We are in a series of talks called Who Needs Church, and it's a conversation that we're walking through the book of Acts together. And so before we get into it, let's welcome everybody who's with us online as well. We're grateful for you guys and you being with us. And if you're here today and you have Facebook, uh, pull out your phone real quick right now in church if you would and uh, share this, this post on Facebook. It's just a great way uh, to get your friends involved and to engage with church uh, maybe from a distance. It can be really uh, challenging and intimidating to go to church for the first time. And so uh, one of the things that we do is leverage technology to give your friends a chance and our friends a chance uh, to join us from online. So wherever you are, we're glad that you're with us as well. Um, so who's been camping yet this summer? We got some campers in the room. Okay, who are the hardcore tent-only campers? Okay, show me the glampers in the room. Who's the glampers? I am officially now a glamper. We got a camper this year. Uh, we have always been tent people. And, uh, you know, some of, those, some of you guys are hardcore campers. Like, some of you military guys are like, it's not camping unless my head's in the mud and it's 20 degrees outside, right? But for me, like, I love just tent camping, being in the outdoors. I've always loved being outside. But this past year, uh, we had an opportunity uh, through a friend of ours to just get a great deal on a used fifth wheel camper. And so we've been getting it all set up and getting the dishes in there. And, like, it's, 
it's the deal, right? It's got the microwave, and it's got the stove, and I just found out it's got air conditioning because I turned it on the other day, and it works, and so that's the coldest room in, on our property is in the camper, and so we got that all cooling down, and I mean, it's just, it's kind of plush, and so the other day I was talking to Amanda, and I was like, oh, we should go tent camping, babe. We should get up in the mountains and just enjoy the, 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 the streams and the, the wilderness, and you can guess what she said. Not a chance, right? She said, I will forever be a glamper. You have ruined me forever because now I've experienced the camping experience in a camper. And, and really, like at this point, we're like cooking pizza rolls in the microwave. We barely ever go outside. I might be, you know, over, over explaining it. But anyway, it's, it's kind of like we, we've fallen in love with the camper more than the camping, right? It's almost like the camper itself has become the point And, you know, the outdoors and where we're at is kind of like a secondary thing to just being in the camper. And the reason I tell you that story is because we're in a season as a church of sort of recalibrating ourselves and asking ourselves, what is this whole thing all about? Like, why do we do church? Why do we go to church? And the reality is sometimes we can sort of fall in love with the vehicle of church, like the gathering of church and the comfort of church and the music and sort of the programming of church rather than falling in love with Jesus and his family. And so what we're doing this summer is reconnecting with all of that and asking ourselves hard questions. Why are we doing what we're doing? Um, we're off-site, obviously. We are in a gymnasium this uh, summer, and our building is getting renovated. And so it's almost like a fast for us as a church. We're fasting from a lot of the production and, and a lot of the, the programming of our typical church experience and just taking a step back and sort of asking ourselves, why do we, why do, we do this? You know, just like, you know, if you're outside, if you're camping, it's like, do I really love being outside or just kind of love being in the camper? Uh, do we really love the church? Or do we sort of come for the experience, right? You know, are we contributors in the family of God or are we sort of consumers in the family of God? And so we are walking through the book of Acts, which is really our story. It's the beginning of the church. And so Jesus has been resurrected, and then the, the disciples had this amazing experience with the Holy Spirit coming down on them. And we believe that the Holy Spirit, God's Spirit, is alive and active in the church today. If you're kind of wondering where we're at, I grew up in a church that didn't talk a whole lot about the Holy Spirit. Um, it's sort of the uh, uncomfortable part of the Trinity. We like the Father and the Son, but the Holy Spirit was a little uncomfortable for our church growing up. We actually believe that God is still doing impossible things today, as we just sang. God is still working miraculous things all around us, and that he wants to do that through our very church right here in Eagle River. And in some ways, we see it every single week. And in other ways, I think God has more for us as we begin to surrender more to him. And we've said this as a theme verse, is Acts chapter 1, verse 8, which simply says that you will be my witnesses from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria to the ends of the earth. And this is our calling as well as something that we've received as those early Christians began to share the good news of the gospel, traveling from town to town. And then ultimately that good news spread all the way to you and I here, wherever you lived, many, many years later. And we're sort of recipients of this message, but we're also carriers of the message. That their mission is our mission today. And as we start to look at the early church, what we'll start to understand is that there, is, there are things of it that I think that God wants for us. Uh, we've said that this, this book, this, this uh, story, really is, it's a story of something that is both descriptive as well as prescriptive. There are parts of it that are just describing how God worked in the early church, but also there are things about it that we could prescribe to us today as we understand how God wants to work and to be active in our lives. And so as we said, Jesus is resurrected. The Holy Spirit comes down upon the church. The, the, this group starts to grow and expand. We see the healing of this, this beggar at the gate of the city, right? And everybody's minds are blown because this man has been lame for his whole life. Everybody knew him. They'd always seen him. And, and at this point, he's healed. Uh, the word is getting out. It's spreading all around town. And it says that their numbers grew to, to 5,000 men that day. Uh, which, you know, we have recorded of the number of men, probably would have translated to maybe 10, even 15,000 people total as the church began to grow and explode. And it says that these people were, were all of one heart and mind. It's really cool when you think about it. I don't know if you've ever run into somebody or met somebody that you thought, man, we're on the same wavelength. 
It's like we're after the same things in life. It's like that we, we kind of see things the same way. It's like we have the same vision. And, and I would say that for the, the church, that is everybody in the church is sort of at, with one heart and mind. I mean, imagine if when you came in here today, you were like, oh, everybody that I meet at ACF is like of the same heart and mind as me. I mean, how cool would that be? We have the same mission, the same vision, the same sort of way of looking at life. And that's how the early church was. And so it was growing. It was expanding. Uh, people were either in or they were out. There were very few people who were sort of riding the coattails of someone else's belief. I mean, you had to really believe it to be in it because there was so much persecution, right? There's so much opposition to this new growing movement of Jesus followers, which is really different from us today, isn't it? I mean, I, was, I think about this and I'm like, man, sometimes I feel like the freedom and the comfort that we have as American Christians is working against us. Have you ever thought about that? Like, I mean, I didn't wake up today and go, should I go to church because I'm risking everything to, to be there, right? I just got up, brushed my teeth, got in my car, and came here. Most of us didn't think of the risk that we could have for being part of the family and the gathering today. And yet many of our brothers and sisters across the world have to think about that all the time. And so in all of that, what that produces around us is sort of this cultural Christianity, which I get that we're sort of moving as a culture away from, from being a, a Christian culture. And yet even in, in the church, there's sort of this kind of cultural thing. We go to church and we just sort of show up. And uh, some of you are from the Bible Belt. Some of you grew up in communities where it's just like church on Sunday, right? That's just sort of part of the routine, and I would tell you in Alaska, I would say that this sort of like religious faith where, where it's just like, you know, you go to church on Sunday is actually traded out for more like a recreational faith. I mean, sometimes we treat Jesus and the church a little bit like we treat camping and going four-wheeling, right? I mean, there's sort of like things that we do sometimes as an addition to our lives instead of a passion that drives our lives. And so we have to be aware of that and consider how could Jesus have died for something that we have no need for? Because Jesus died for the church. He didn't just die for you. He didn't just die for me. He died for this family, this community, for all of us. So clearly God himself says, this is worth my life. And yet sometimes we're like, I could take it or leave it. Depends on how I feel. Depends on the situation. I'm not sure it's a big deal. And so here, here they are, one heart together, which is so cool. I mean, imagine even just this room. Imagine if we all, like every one of us, were doing something together. Just one thing that we believed with our entire hearts together. Uh, imagine the power and the strength of that. Imagine how that movement would grow. So they're of one heart, one mind together. And it also says that they had everything in common, which means that they brought whatever they had for resources to the table to serve the church and to serve the mission. And, it's, and it, what's amazing about that is that there wasn't, it wasn't coercion. You know, it wasn't like a slick sales pitch that they were getting, like, oh, you know, I'll, I'll buy that. No, it was this, this movement of the Spirit and people, this belief that, that, that Jesus was the Messiah. I mean, he's the real deal. And we have eyewitnesses, people who have seen Jesus in the flesh after uh, the crucifixion. And so this movement, this belief that Jesus was truly the Messiah is growing and expanding, and because of that deep-seated belief in their hearts, they are a generous people. And so last week we talked about a specific guy, uh, Barnabas, right? And Barnabas, we call him Barney. Barney was a very generous guy. His name just means encourager. He was an encourager to the church. We see him coming alongside Paul later on in, in, in life. And this man shows up, and he says, hey, I don't know what I can bring to the table, but I have this land. And I see this need within the church, and so I'm going I'm to sell my land and bring the money, the proceeds, to the apostles' feet. And I think it serves a couple of purposes. First, he, he wanted to serve. He wanted to help people. He wanted to be generous. But secondarily, I believe that this man, Barnabas, was a leader. And that he saw himself as an influencer in the church. And he knew that if I'm to do this, if I'm to, to make this, this great act of generosity, that people will follow and continue being generous, that this will kind of stir people up towards generosity, which is something that we're to do. And so he brings the money to the apostles' feet. It's a public gift. It's a public offering that people see. And it wasn't to get people to admire him. It wasn't because he wanted to impress anyone. It was just because he wanted to lead. And so you see that stirring people up 
And so my message today, I've, I've entitled, That Escalated Quickly. That Escalated Quickly. Anybody read chapter 5 yet? Anybody actually read it? A few of you guys have read ahead, and you showed up anyway. Man, you guys are awesome. The rest of you will figure out why I said that in just a minute. That Escalated Quickly. Have you ever been in a situation where things just kind of went too far, too fast? Uh, maybe you had a sort of a disagreement with a friend. And it started off just like, man, we're, we're together on this. And then in a moment, you guys are both screaming at each other. You're hot-headed. You're, you're angry. And it just kind of blew up way too fast. Uh, maybe you've been driving down the road and, you know, you didn't know it, but you're on black ice. And just a little bit of a turn, all of a sudden you're spinning around. You're in the ditch. And, you know, it's just this, these moments where things change in a second. And what we're going to see today is this, this situation where these two people, Ananias and Sapphira, have a moment where their lives are dramatically changed. Ultimately, because of their deception, God calls them home in an act of judgment on their decision. And so we've got this interesting uh, narrative where Luke, who's the, the writer of this, uh, this book, he, he talks about Barnabas. And then there's this sort of unfortunate chapter break between chapter 4 and chapter 5. And the chapters we added way later just to help us kind of pick apart and uh, find our way through the Bibles. But really, this is one continuous thought. And Luke's trying to, to describe both, I would say, two different things. Both Barnabas as a beautiful example of, of generosity and of following God. And then Ananias and Sapphira as a really challenging warning to the church. So you've got, you've got Barnabas, a, a beautiful example, Ananias and Sapphira as a challenging reminder and warning to the church. And I'll tell you, before we get into this, um, this story kind of makes me squirm a little bit. Uh, if you've read ahead, you, you've got to deal with a little tension, right? I mean, we see sort of God's judgment poured out on these two, and, 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 and it's easy to be like, God, that's, how, that's, that's the old God, Right? I mean, you used to do that in the Old Testament, like remember the flood, you know, remember, you know, the wiping out of the Canaanites and these things that God did. And we're like, man, that's the old you, God. But now post-resurrection, you're not supposed to do things like that, right? I mean, it's almost like we think God changed. But one thing we know about God is he is unchanging. God never changes. And while he may relate to humanity differently because of the cross, God is still just. And I will tell you, as I walk into this, one of the main reasons that I'm uncomfortable is because I approach God really um, lackadaisically. Is that a word? Lackadaisically? I, I just I kind of comfortably come to God. I don't think a whole lot about it. You know, it's time for worship, and I'm just like, okay, I guess I'll sing to you, you know. Um, I'm reading the word. I'm in prayer. I just sort of like nonchalantly approach this holy being and forget that he is different than me. And, and that, that we're separate. That he's the creator and I'm the created being. And it's so easy, I think, for us in the church, especially in America, to very nonchalantly approach this holy, indifferent God. And so when we read things like this, we get really uncomfortable. But I would tell you, too, um, don't forget that the book of Revelations in the New Testament as well. And if you've ever read that, there's some pretty crazy stuff that happens as God shows up to judge the world and separate uh, those who follow him from those who do not. And so we know that God doesn't change. We know that there is, that he is the righteous and good judge. And even in the things like this, this story that we're going to get into, even in these stories, God is always motivated by love. And it's always an act of grace. And you might be like, well, they probably didn't think so. But God is always motivated by love and by grace, both for the people engaged as well for, as for his church. And so this story may make you squirm just a little bit. I think one of the other reasons it makes me squirm is because I see too much of myself in Ananias and Sapphira. And with different situations, I'm like, well, I, I don't do things like that. So when God pours out his judgment, I'm like, that's not me. I'm, I'm not that type of person. But then in this story, I'm like, I kind of see some similarities. It makes me squirm because I see a lot of myself in them or a lot of them in me. And before we get into Acts chapter 5, if you have a Bible, open up to the book of Leviticus. Uh, Leviticus chapter 10, verse 1. We don't, we don't get into Leviticus very often, but Leviticus is really sort of like, a, like an instruction manual for how to worship God. And uh, God is very specific about how he's to be worshipped. And we see very specific instructions about what this looks like. 
And in Act, or Leviticus chapter 10, we see this really sort of disturbing story of these two, these two priests who were the sons of Aaron. And they are actually struck dead by God because they dishonor the temple by breaking God's commands in the way that God is to be worshipped. And again, this is a situation where like, man, this, this makes me uncomfortable. Let's, let's read this. Leviticus 10, verse 1. It says, Aaron's sons, Nadab and Abihu, put coals of fire in their incense burners and sprinkled incense over them. In this way, they disobeyed the Lord by burning before him the wrong kind of fire, different than he had commanded. So the first thing we see is, it's like, what did God command? Well, God had commanded that the fire that they used to burn incense would have come from the altar. That's not where they got this fire. We don't know where it came from, but not from where God had commanded it to come from. Verse 2, so fire blazed forth from the Lord's presence and burned them up, and they died there before the Lord. That escalated quickly, right? I mean, I mean can we be honest and be like, seriously, God? That, that's, it seems like the punishment doesn't fit the crime, right? Verse 3, then Moses said to Aaron, this is what the Lord meant when he said, listen to this, I will display my holiness through those people who come near me. I will display my glory before all people. Let me read that again. I will display my holiness through those who come near me. We have a holy God, a set-apart God. And where these two failed was that they failed to remember that God is different than us. God is separate from us. And when God speaks, he actually means what he says. And again, we read this and we go, man, God, it seems like the punishment doesn't fit the crime. It seems like it escalated too quickly. But there's always more to the story. We see God protecting his people. We see God, as he does things that we, we would say, man, that seems so harsh. God is actually protecting the purity of his people. As he rids the sin and the people, and they're, they're de- deceiving others from the, the people of God. He's actually protecting the people. You see, I think that we fall into this camp a lot of times. We, we try to sort of follow God, right? And we think, well, God should just take what I give him. And so when he tells us something, we think, well, I, I'm kind of doing what he says. Don't I get some participation points, right? Can I at least get a participation trophy for at least trying to do this? And the, the thing is, God's like, no, I'm very specific about how you're to follow me. You're either being obedient or disobedient, but there is no middle ground. There is no middle ground for just doing something. And the thing is, when we disobey God, which, which we do, just as they do, when we disobey God, it's greater than just being about ourselves. It's not just about our relationship with God. You see, when we disobey God, we tell the world, God isn't holy, God is equal. That's what we tell our friends and our neighbors. You know, God's not holy, he's actually equal to us. He's not set apart, he's not different, he's actually just like me. And these two, these two uh, priests, they had an uncle, his name is Moses. And Moses had a really similar problem to them, you remember? This moment where uh, he, he's, supposed to, he's supposed to speak to the rock to get the water to come out, to give to the people. And instead of speaking to the rock, what's he do? He strikes the rock, right? And when he strikes the rock, he disobeys what God had told him to do. And because of that, he's unable to enter the promised land. That escalated quickly, right? We're going like, God, God he, was, oh, he was following you. He's leading these griping, complaining people. You know, I mean, this guy had a hard job. I mean, Moses had a really difficult job, and he's doing all of this, and in that moment, because he didn't obey you the way that you wanted God, he's not able to enter the promised land. Once again, God will display his holiness through those who come near to him. I mean, this is one of the things, if you're here and you're like, man, I have been pursuing God. I'm seeking to come near God, then what we need to acknowledge is that God is going to display his holiness within us. And we need to acknowledge that when we approach him, he's a holy God. Now, why did these two, you know, bring this different fire to the altar? We don't really know. Some commentators say that maybe they were drunk. They may have been drinking. Uh, They may have been just full of pride. 
and, and sort of had this thing where they felt like, well, God, you should take whatever we bring to you. And so they had this thought that they could just bring whatever fire to, uh, to, to burn the incense instead of doing exactly what God had told them. Either way, what we can see here very clearly is that they were liable, right? Apparently, I was drunk isn't a good, good excuse for God, right? Or apparently, if, if we're just like, man, I, just, I was a little proud in that moment. Um, give me, help me, just understand that I was, I was struggling in that moment. God's like, you're still liable for the decisions that you make, right? And again, we see God's grace in all of this, but we need to understand God's holiness and how separate he is. And the question is, how did, how did they get there? I mean, this is something I was wrestling with this week. How did these guys get to this point? Because we just see this one moment, but I wonder if there's more going on in their hearts. I mean, have you ever been in a moment where you thought, how did I get to this point? Maybe, maybe, maybe last night, maybe this week, you were like, how did I get here? I don't even know what I did. But now I'm in this situation, and it's, and it's bad. Here's what James chapter 1, verse 14 says. It says, but each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own what? Desire. Whose desire? Our own, right? By his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. And so we can see uh, in this, that bad desires are always pregnant with bad decisions. You see, we have bad desires. And we all have bad desires, and, and those bad desires aren't necessarily sinful. We can have, I have bad desires, we have thoughts that we know are not good thoughts, things that wouldn't honor God and others, and those thoughts in and of themselves aren't necessarily sinful, but those thoughts are pregnant with bad decisions, right? We've all been there. Uh, so we went I went into a boat shop this, this weekend. That was a bad idea. Because I do not need a boat right now. And my desires started, they started growing, I'm telling you. I mean, this thing was sparkly, and it had cup holders everywhere, and a V8 something or other. And I mean, it's, it's awesome, right? And I had to be like, babe, we got to get out of here. I mean, this is, this is like, I got to flee the den of iniquity. Get me out of this place, because I am going to buy a boat if we don't stay, if we don't get out of here. And but I know that, like, my desires are going to result in some debt, right? Some debt that I don't need right now. And so for me, right now, that's not a good place to be. And if I were to just kind of do whatever I felt like, I would probably find myself in a bad decision because my bad desires are pregnant with bad decisions. I mean, have you been there before where you had a, you had a bad desire in high school that gave birth to a bad decision in college, right? You had some bad desires maybe um, early on in your career, that gave birth to bad decisions later in your career. I mean, even, as we said, financially, you had some bad desires early on in the years, and you're still paying for those bad decisions today, right? And every month, the payment comes. Every month, the payment is due. See, for them, they always had a decision to make about what they do with their desires. They can either foster them, or they can confess them to God and to others and deal with them. But again, this isn't about your life alone. And this, is, this series is called Who Needs Church because all of this affects the entire community of God. And it affects our mission to the world. If we're to be an Acts 1-8 community, which is our heart as a church, is that we would go to our Jerusalem, our Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. That is our heart as a community. Then we need to be aware of our desires and our decisions. Because when sin is left unchecked, it distorts the message of the gospel to the world. Do you know that? Like we, we are speaking a distorted message of the gospel to our friends. You see, our values start to leak out, right? Our passions start to leak out. Our priorities start to leak out. What we see as God leaks out to people around us. And in the end, it doesn't matter how much we preach. We can say all the right words, right? But people are going to hear what we do more than they hear what we say. Is that not right? The parents know this in the room, right? Your kids don't become what you tell them to become. They sort of become who you are, which is terrifying. Uh, one of the things for me as a pastor that somebody told me uh, when I first became a pastor was, Brian, um, your church will start to look just like you. And I just wanted to throw up in the corner. I'll be honest. Because that, that's, a, that's, a, that's a certain way. And, and of course, there's grace there. There's grace for all of us. And, and, uh, and, and we're going to blow it sometimes. But we have to understand that 
Our decisions, our life is preaching a message to the world. It may be the gospel that people are hearing and it may not be. But these bad desires lead to bad decisions and those bad decisions, when left unchecked, distort the message of the gospel. Here's how it works. Is that when you willingly walk in sin, you devalue your life. You know that you are intrinsically valuable. No matter where you came from today, no matter what you've done or, or what you did last night, God says that you are worth dying for. But when we sin, it's us saying, no, I, I'm not worth the best. I'm not worth what God has for me. So we, when we walk in sin, we devalue our lives. When you devalue your life, you devalue the cross. Because Jesus died. He didn't just say you're valuable. He showed that you're valuable, right? Because he gave his life for you. And when you devalue the cross, you devalue God himself. Because it wasn't someone else that died for your sins. It was God himself. The God of the universe died for you. And when you devalue God himself, it's no wonder people devalue the church. You see how this all connects together, right? You see how we can't sort of like truncate our decisions from the family of God or the message of the gospel to the world? It's all connected, and it comes down to our own integrity, which the story that we're at today is a story of challenge because it challenges our hearts. I mean, it kinda, if, you're, if you're open to it today, I believe God wants to kind of rip your heart open for a moment, and he wants to kind of show you some things and reveal some things where maybe to others, and even to yourself, it looks clean and pure and good, but on the inside, you know that your motivations are, are, are rotten, right? And that's what this story does to us. It's why, it's why um, I was doing some research this week. A, a lot of pastors skip this story. It, it's a lot easier to skip on, but I think we need to talk about this stuff. I think it's huge. And so Acts chapter 5, grab a Bible. If you, if you don't have one, open up the ACF Church app. We're going to be in verse 1. So again, this is a continuation. Barnabas has sold his land. He's been this beautiful example. Luke wants to tell us about a bit of a warning for us. It says this, But a man named Ananias, which the name Ananias just means the Lord has graciously given. So this man has had God's grace poured out on him. God's mercy has been poured out on him. With his wife Sapphira, sold a piece of property. And with his wife's knowledge, he kept back for himself some of the proceeds and brought only a part of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and to keep back for yourself part of the proceeds of the land? So if you ever wondered, where did Satan first show up in the church? He showed up first in the church in the temptation towards greed. That's where Satan first looked for a foothold and a stronghold in the church. That's why we're talking about it today. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? You have not lied to man, but to God. And when Ananias heard these words, he fell down and breathed his last. And great fear came upon all who heard of it. The young men rose and wrapped him up and carried him out and buried him. After an interval, interval of about three hours, his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. And Peter said to her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yes, for so much. But Peter said to her, How is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. When the young men came in, they found her dead, and they carried her out and buried her beside her husband. And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard these things. Okay, who's uncomfortable? I mean, I, I am with that story. I'm uncomfortable for a lot of different reasons. The first I already explained, which is that to some degree we're like, ah, oh, man, I kind of thought God wasn't like that anymore, right? It's like, no, God didn't lose his justice at the cross. Sure, God pours out his wrath that was due to us upon Jesus, but God is still a righteous and good judge, and one day he will judge all of the world and all of humanity, including us, right? We're either in Christ or still in our sin, one or the other. I mean, another reason I think that we don't like this story and it's uncomfortable is because it relates to our money, right? 
And I just want to tell you, if you're new to church, or if you're sitting here and you're like, Brian, I just finally got my friend to come to church, and you're going to bring up the money talk, like seriously, um, know this. Like if you're brand new, we want nothing from you, please. There's going to be an offering that gets passed at the end of the service. This one's on us. Don't feel any obligation to give anything. Please, please don't. But one thing I do know is that this is something that we, we must talk about. I mean, in fact, Jesus seems to talk a lot about money. A lot about money. It's almost like Jesus knows that if God hasn't gotten into our checkbooks, he probably hasn't gotten into our hearts. And so Jesus talks a lot about our finances. And I used to, when I first became a pastor, be really scared to talk about finances because I always see the discomfort in the room. And I see people kind of squirming in their seats and like needing a water break during church, right? Lots of movement, lots of discomfort. But I, I just felt so convicted that like not talking about money in the church would be like not talking about alcohol to Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, right? Like, like, like we deal with, with this sense of greed and, and, and struggle with money just like anybody else does. And so we need to talk about it. I think, I think the reason we're so uncomfortable with it is it, it, it hits too close to home. Really, it's just this is really getting in our personal life. And, and we like to be open about certain things, but not these type of things I think another reason we get uncomfortable with this topic is most people have seen churches lose their way when it comes to money. Um, you've probably seen like a financial scandal or uh, some pastor who robbed the church or, uh, or maybe a church that did a building campaign or project and for, you know, six years all they talked about was money. And so you're afraid, you get like uncomfortable that that becomes the mission instead of the mission God had given the church. I think another reason this story makes us uncomfortable is it shows us that partial obedience is actually called disobedience, and we don't like that. Once again, we forget that God is holy. He should take whatever we give him, and God says, I actually am very specific about what I'm asking you to do, and obedience is only found in doing specifically what I ask you to do, and I'd say the reason the primary reason we're uncomfortable is because this is the number one thing that people don't want to give to God. And I've been a pastor for 17 years now, doing various things in the church. And one thing I've seen across the board is that this is the number one foothold that God has on the church today. I mean, he's got a foothold in, in our sexuality. He's got a foothold in our pride. But he has got a foothold in our greed. I think greater than any other, it's the reason Jesus spoke to, so much to it. It's the reason that the enemy attacked the church first in this department and and continues to do so today but we need to deal with this text what went wrong so quickly what went wrong so fast verse 2 says and with his wife's knowledge he kept back for himself some of the proceeds right so you have a couple that together creates a plan and they keep back some of the proceeds what went wrong i think the first thing is that they loved money they loved money we know this, that the love of the money is the root of all what? Evil, right? And don't be confused. Money is not the root of all evil. Money's not bad. Money's a, a great resource that God gives his church. But the love of money is the root of all kinds, various kinds of evil. I mean, terrible atrocities have been done for the sake of money, right? And, and, and in this story, I, I got to ask, what happened, right? When I was reading it, I was like, well, well, why? Why would they make a decision to do this? And so you've got Barnabas, Barney, who's so generous, and I'd imagine that they watched him do this, as, as well as many, probably thousands of other people, watch Barnabas be a generous man. And he's able to walk away um, with a clean heart, right? Because he wasn't doing it to prove anything, he was just following Jesus and being a good leader, right? And so he does it publicly, and they're like, man, everybody loves Barney, <laughs> right? Everybody's taking selfies with Barney, Everybody's hashtagging generous Barney, right? Everybody loves Barney. We want that kind of fame. We want that kind of approval from our friends. And so they go, well, we should sell our land. Let's, let's do the same thing and see what happens. And, and I would guess that, I'm going to speculate a little bit, maybe they put the land on, on the market, and maybe it was a market like we have in Alaska right now where it's just exploding, the real estate, lots of stuff's selling right now, and a lot of houses being bought. And, and, and I would guess... Maybe there was like a bidding war, and two people wanted it, three people wanted it, four people wanted the property. So they had a price they thought they were going to get for it, and then they actually had this amount that they ended up getting for it. I remember we sold our house in Colorado in uh, 2009, 
And we had no idea that we were selling at the very top of the market. We'd only been in there for, you know, five or six years, and, and, and the house had gained a bunch of equity. We sold the house. The market crashed, as many of you probably experienced. And, and then, like a year later, we saw that same house back on the market for like $100,000 less than what we, we had sold it for. The market had crashed that bad. And it's interesting, like we were forced to make decisions, right? Because now all of a sudden we've got resources. What do we do with those resources? I would say for the same thing. They're like, oh God, we're going to be so generous. And God's like, well then I'm going to pour out my grace on you. So God pours out his grace. They maybe get more money than what they thought they were going to get. And now they have a decision to make, don't they? Huh. Wow, God, you really, boy, you really blessed us on this one, didn't you? And so they made a decision together to keep back, it says, to keep back some of the money. Now, one of the specific things that it says is that with his wife's knowledge, in other words, they had a talk. They had a talk. Like his husband and wife, um, we're to be cheering for each other to be more like Jesus, right? I mean, I'm asking my wife to cheer for me to be like Jesus, and I want to cheer for her to be more like Jesus. But in this specific situation, they were not good for each other, were they? I mean, they did, they did not uphold their job as husband and wife to love the other person because they weren't willing to stand up for what they knew was right. And so with her full knowledge, the husband kept back. Proverbs 13.10 says, Whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. So who do you put yourself around? Now, we, I've said this before, you are sort of... Um, you're sort of like the, the uh, you become like the five closest people to you, right? I mean, look at your friends. Look who is closest to you, and you sort of become the average of your five closest friends. I don't know who, if you have five friends who are drinking a lot, guess what you're probably going to start doing? Drinking a lot, right? If you have five friends who um, serve a lot in the church, you'll probably start serving a lot more. If you have five friends who are super generous people, there's a good chance that you'll start becoming generous, right? You, you might be like, no, I'm at the top of the curve. You're probably somewhere in the middle like I am, right? We're all, we're all motivated by the people who are around us, right? It says, and Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? What's interesting is that that's what he was doing, and, and he probably didn't even know it. They probably didn't even think of it, like, are we testing God right now? No, they just thought they were going to deceive some people into thinking that they were more generous than they were. But it actually says that they are testing God by doing what they're doing. Uh, I remember a, a good friend of mine back in high school, um, he was one of those guys who did everything with 110%. He was all in, just obsessive about whatever he was into. And one day he comes by my house and he just bought this new motorcycle. And this thing is just like super fast, you know, goes zero to 80 in, you know, 2.5 seconds or something. It's just a rocket ship. And he'd been watching all these videos on YouTube about how to like do, do some cool tricks on this bike. So he's doing wheelies and endos and like all kinds of stuff. And I'm like, you're going to kill yourself, dude. He's like, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. So one day he comes by my work. I was working at a car wash. And he's like, hey, man, I figured out this new, this new trick. And I'm like, what is it? He's like, it's called, it's called the Iron Cross. And I'm like, well, what is that? And he's like, well, what you do is you're going like 40 miles an hour, you kick the bike up into neutral, and you stand on the seat, and you just ride it out. <laughs> and I'm like, you can't do that. And he's like, oh, yes, I can. And so he jumps on the bike, and he goes around the corner, and, you know, pops it up to like 60 miles an hour, and then kicks it into neutral, and stands on the seat, and sure enough, I'm like, no way. And he's looking at me doing the, the head nod, you know. And then right then, the front tire hits a pothole. And it's just like, whoosh, 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 back and forth. And then he tries to jump down and grab it. And the bike just barrels up into a tree. And I had to take him to the ER. His hands were like hamburger. It was just a total, total disaster. But it was so hard for me not to give him the, I told you so, right? Because over, over time, over time when you're testing things like that, you just keep pushing it and pushing it. At some point, you're going to get hurt, right? And I wonder for you, if you just take an inventory of your life at, in some way or another, I wonder, are, are you testing the Spirit of God? Is there something that you're sort of like, I hope that doesn't come back to bite me? Are you in some way going, God's, sure, he's holy and different, but he's not concerned with this part of my life right now. And see, for them, God has poured out his grace upon them, and God can just as quickly remove his grace from them. 
And the same is true for any of us today. Where are you testing the Spirit of the Lord? Some of you probably need to go home and uh, either with a friend or with your spouse, you need to open up like your Amazon history. Now it's getting real in this room, right? You guys are so uncomfortable looking. And you just need to show them like, here's what I purchased for a little while. I mean, some of you need to go home and have an honest conversation about your finances with somebody that you trust. Where is it that you're testing God? Maybe you're in a relationship. Maybe you're dating somebody and you're pushing physical boundaries that you're just like, I hope that doesn't come back to bite me. And you need to ratchet it back and just go, okay, I gotta, I gotta reassess this whole situation and be honest with myself. Because apparently that's what it looks like to love someone, is to have those type of conversations. Let's keep going. Verse 4. While it remained unsold, did it not remain your own, he says? And after it was sold, was it not at your disposal? Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? See, that's, that's harsh, but it's true. I mean, they may have deceived themselves into thinking it was okay. Um, you know, they might have, well, we just made a mistake, which is what we do to try to kind of minimize our bad decisions. We call them mistakes, right? We don't like to call them sin or rebellion. We just say we made a mistake. But Peter's like, no, you actually contrived this within your heart. You allowed something to grow inside of you. That, 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 th- that thought process has resulted in the behavior. I think the second thing that went wrong for them is that they had more cash than character. It's interesting, when we talk about money, don't we talk about blessing? And when you think, when somebody like, shows up and they got this sweet new diesel truck or like a really nice car or a really nice house, you're like, man, you guys are so blessed, Right? Do you know that the Bible doesn't talk about money that way? That Jesus doesn't talk about money that way? When Jesus talks about money, he talks about it less like a blessing and more like a burden. I mean, can I just tell you, if you have somebody that has some, some, some money, or if you yourself have some, mo- have some money, first be, be praying for your, for your friends and then have people pray for you. I mean, instead of just going, man, you're so blessed, you need to, you need to open up and be like, man, I just, I want to pray that, that this doesn't steal your heart. I want to pray that, that God can guide you and that you're able to continue to be faithful to him in this. And I know people that have gotten more resources and more resources given to them, and it is a burden. I mean, many people would admit that, that it is a burden to bear. I know people who are like, I don't know who my friends are anymore. I mean, ever since I started making, you know, over six, or six figures, I started wondering, like, who likes me? Who wants to hang out with me? Or who just wants something from me? It becomes a great burden. And as Luke 12, 38 says, everyone to whom much was given, of him much will be required. So for them, they they were given more resources than they had character to manage their resources. I mean, this applies to a lot of things. If you've got great influence, but not the character to manage your influence, you will crash in a ball of flames, right? If you have money, but not the character to manage your money, you will crash in a ball of flames. We see it all the time. They had more cash than character. In verse 4, it says, Why is it that you have contrived this deed in your heart? Man, this, this, and this last part hurts. You have not lied to man, but to God. See, the third thing that I think I see here is that they were motivated by admiration. They really wanted people to love them. They really wanted people to see how holy they were and how supportive they were of this movement. And here's what I've learned is that there are people who are really actually part of the family of God and propelling it forward on the mission that God has given them. And then there are those who sort of look like they are, but they're really not. And it's really hard to tell. But this is one sort of, it's like pulling the dipstick. When you check somebody's finances, it's like pulling the dipstick on a car, right? You can, you can tell a lot by pulling the dipstick out on a car. You can tell a lot when you audit your finances. And so this topic is just hard, but for them, they were motivated not so much by the grace that God had given them, not so much to lead others well, but to be admired by other people. I remember our first um, year in, in, uh, in ministry as a pastor, uh, we were getting into the finances of church and dealing with some of those things, and I remember talking to one of our counters. We have a team of people who um, count money every week and deal with all that, and we have a whole system for that to keep it of just high integrity. And so I was talking with those people and they were like telling me how every week they got like four or five empty giving envelopes. And I was like, why do you get those in in there? Like, do people not know where to put them? They're like, no, people just put them in every week, empty giving envelopes. 
And it dawned on me, that's, what that, that's what's going on here, right? If somebody here is like, I don't want to be seen as greedy, but I don't want to actually give anything, so it's much easier to just put an envelope in the offering. And what it says in the scripture, and, and this hits all of us, because we've all deceived others before. But it says that you weren't just deceiving other people. Like, you think that you're lying to other people. That's what Ananias and Sapphira contrived to do. Let's lie to people. They did. Let's deceive them into thinking that we're more generous than, than, than we are. But, but Peter says, you didn't lie to people. You lied to God. Like, this isn't about them. This is about your heart being honest with God. And at the end of all this, it says, And great fear came upon the whole church and upon all who heard this. Well, I guess, right? I mean, I guess if, if at some point during the church, church service here, somebody drops something in the offering plate and they just drop dead, we'd be like, oh, snap, right? Like, time to take a personal audit. God's holy, right? Can I just ask, why do we need that? Does it really take something like that for us to realize how different God is from us? and how good he is, and how gracious he's been. Does it really take something like that? Like, like is, is the goal really, like, can we just test the spirit right up until the point of his loving discipline, and then maybe we'll backtrack and make a, make a different decision? What, what, if, what if we today could make some different choices that would change the trajectory of our lives, and that might even change the trajectory of this church? Because we together both share in our successes and in our failures. And when I fail as a person, you guys feel it. And you might not even know what it is. You might not even know what I did. But what you see is a little bit of disconnect. You see me become a little less committed. A little, miss, a little less passionate about my faith. And, that, and everybody feels that. Just as much as when you fall into the trap of Ananias and Sapphira, we all feel it. But here's what's so cool is that I, I believe that the Spirit of God wants to affect us in a powerful way today. And that He wants us to be of one heart and mind. And so I'm asking you today to just be honest with God. Because that's all this situation would have taken. God is not asking for perfection. He's asking you to be honest. And that's the difference between a hypocrite and a sinner. Somebody who's a hypocrite is somebody who's not honest. But a sinner is somebody in desperate need of grace, but they know it. And they're honest about it, and they're making steps to, to change it. And here's the thing. I, I know this serves as a wonderful example with Barnabas, a challenging um, warning with these two. But I was thinking about this moment where Jesus is on the cross, and he's, he's got these two similar situations on either side of him, right? He's got this guy who's like, Jesus, if you're the Messiah, get us off this cross. Save yourself. Save us. But even to the point of death, he holds on to his doubt, right? He rejects the Messiah, even to the point of death. Then on the other side, you see this other man who's like, Jesus, would you remember me in your kingdom? And Jesus says, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so as much as we're like, man, that escalated quickly. God, how could you judge somebody like that in such you know, a, a way that seems really harsh to us? Do you know that just as quickly, in a single moment, God can pour out his lavish grace upon your life? That just as quickly as we can receive judgment, God is just as quick to give you grace if you're willing to ask for it. And so don't let your sin or deception keep you from the cross today. I want you to let it propel you to your knees. So would you stand up? I'd love to pray for you. And, and honestly, if, if you need to just sit during worship today, I want to encourage you to do that. If you do need to be on your knees, if God speaks to you, if you just need to lift your hands, do it. Don't test the Spirit. Follow the Spirit. Let's pray. God, we acknowledge that your Spirit wants to speak to us today. And um, we are humbled. And God, we know in so many ways we are a people of unclean lips who have made unclean decisions. And we walk in here with all kinds of baggage and, and we stand before a holy God. And sometimes, God, we don't even want to be near you when we know what we've done because we know how different you are from us. But God, I pray we would resist that temptation, God, that we would be plunged to our knees before you. God, thank you so much 
that when we humble ourselves, you are quick to forgive. God, you are quick to receive us and to welcome us into your family. God, thank you so much for meeting us right where we are, calling us your sons, calling us your daughters. We love you, Jesus. We pray it in your name. Amen. Amen. Love you guys.